Hi, everyone. Ryan Honeyman here from Lyft Economy. As many of you know, in 2014, I wrote the B Corp Handbook, How You Can Use Business as a Force for Good. I'm excited to announce that the completely revised and updated second edition of the B Corp Handbook is launching this year on April 23rd, 2019. I co-authored the new version of the book with Dr. Tiffany Jana, an internationally recognized expert in diversity, equity, and inclusion. The book now provides guidance on how to dramatically enhance your company's social and environmental impact while ensuring that you center equity at every step. So please order your copy today by visiting lifteconomy.com slash book. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash book. Thanks for your support. And now on with the show. Welcome to Next Economy Now. I'm your host, Andrew Baskin. The goal of this interview series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, democratic, diverse, transparent, and whole systems approach to using business as a force for good. Nature is everything. The health of nature as a system underlies success of every industrial or social system. Nature is not just Yosemite, Kilimanjaro, or, or, or Rincon. It is really the ecosystem as a whole that underlies and connects life. Welcome to the Patagonia Mini MBA, a special four-part interview series with Vincent Stanley, Director of Philosophy at Patagonia. Out of over 150 episodes of Next Economy Now, our most listened to episodes of all time are from our interviews with Rick Ridgway, Rose Marcario, Vincent Stanley, and Phil Graves, all of whom work for Patagonia. So Vincent and I decided to do a series of conversations about Patagonia's vision, culture, strategy, and operations to do a deeper dive into specific business practices and give listeners greater insights into how the company operates, thus the mini MBA name. So that's what we'll be doing over the next four episodes. And without further ado, here's my conversation with Vincent Stanley. All right, everyone. Welcome to an interview series with Vincent Stanley from Patagonia. The the sort of intention and goal of, of this interview series is to really look at Patagonia and get into a deeper collaboration and dialogue with Vincent because he's been there since the very early days of Patagonia. Not since the very start, but almost. (laughs) Vincent and I wanted to kind of do a conversation around business-focused topics around vision, culture, strategy, and operations. And we just thought we'd frame up some of these questions and then see where it goes. So uh, maybe, Vincent, in case folks don't know who you are, who are you? (laughs) And how how are you connected to Patagonia? First of all, thanks for doing this. Uh, second, my, you know, my connection actually does go back to the beginning of Patagonia. I wasn't, uh, uh, Chouinard Equipment had been a mountain climbing equipment company for about 15 years before uh, I arrived on the scene. I was um, Yvonne's nephew. I'm a writer and I was already a writer by vocation when I came to work at the company. But I was 20 years old and I intended to stay for six months and 45 years later, I'm still there. And seven years ago, I had a chance to really sit down and and think about the company and think about the culture over that 40-year period and write a book with Evo called The Responsible Company. So ever since then, at that time, I was uh, winding down operational responsibilities. I was head of the editorial department, and then this was more recently, and then acting head of marketing for a couple of years. And then in the last five years, my title has been uh, Director of Philosophy. And essentially what I do is to work with uh, employees, training new employees and and, uh, longstanding employees in company history and values. I work a lot with business students, particularly with a cohort at Yale who are joint students between the environmental and the business uh, schools. And then I work a lot sort of visiting uh, uh, B Corps and talking to uh, people who are entrepreneurs who see Patagonia as a kind of model and uh, trying to be helpful where I can. So that's what I do. Yes. Some might call it their dream job, what you do. It's a pretty good job. Um, I'm I'm definitely not doing something that uh, anybody else defines for me. This is something that has come out of the experience and feels pretty good to do. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things Vincent and I had talked about was talking about some of the critical moments. As listeners have heard, you know, Vincent did write a book, The Responsible Company. So there is sort of a long and deep history. And Yvonne has a book, um, Let My People Go Surfing. And we thought that, you know, for this, maybe we could talk about some of the critical moments that have evolved. And so we had identified the climbing uh, and pitons sort of 
story, mm -hmm. the uh, Ventura River, the organic cotton shift, and don't buy this jacket. And so, so maybe right. with the the climbing and tetons, I actually didn't know that Schoenard Equipment Company had been around for fifteen years, even. So yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. And so yeah, what's the story on the climbing equipment and tetons? Yeah. Well, it, yeah, and and just to give a, give a kind of umbrella for these four stories, I think these four stories illustrate the development of our business culture and also of our business model over the past 45 years. And I think it's critical that we started out in climbing equipment. Um, Evo started as a teenager. He was interested in falconry and started to go out to Stony Point in Chatsworth, which is a great rock climbing area where the falcons had their nests. He started climbing basically to reach the nests. And then after being a falconer for a year or two, he stopped working with the birds, but he continued to climb. And as a teenager, he was traveling in the summer to Yosemite. This is in the late 1950s. It was the origin of big wall climbing in Yosemite. Nobody had climbed these uh, four to 5,000 foot walls before. And all of the equipment that climbers had available to them was imported from Europe, which has had a long standing alpine tradition. So everything came from Germany, Italy, Austria. And the pitons, which are the metal spikes that climbers use to uh, for protection that connect to ropes in case of a fall. The pitons were made of very soft iron and they would degrade after you hammered them in once or twice. And if you're on a long climb and your, your rope is 150 to 165 feet, you can imagine the incredible amount of metal that people had to carry with them. So Elon's invention was the hard steel piton that he got from a very gifted old climber named John Salafay, who was also a uh, uh, ran a blacksmith shop in Palo Alto. And uh, Evo uh, developed um, this method of making a piton that would survive many hammerings in and many hammerings out. He borrowed um, $800 from my grandparents to uh, buy a used coal-fired forge, and he took a book out of the Burbank Library to teach himself how to blacksmith. So that was the origin of the company. And over the next 15 years, he became very famous for his hard steel pitons, but he also, he and his partner, Tom Frost, he was the designer, Tom was the engineer. They reconfigured almost every piece of equipment that a climber uses from crampons to ice axes to uh, even to uh, shoes. So the critical story for Patagonia is not that Chenard Equipment had a great reputation for making the best climbing equipment in the world, which it did. It's the moral lesson we had from when we the people who were at the company learned that there was a problem, an environmental problem caused by the equipment they were making. And what happened is that in the late 1960s, early 1970s, climbing became more popular. And as it became more popular, new climbers would come in and they'd climb the same routes. They'd climb the classics, the ones they'd heard of in El Dorado Canyon and Schwangunks and uh, Yosemite. And what happened is every time you placed one of these pitons, hammered one of them into a crack, it widened it slightly. And the degradation over time was enough that you started to have to use larger and larger angle pitons uh, in order to do the climb. So for Evo and his partner and for the, for the nine or 10 people who worked at the shop, this was a big question because the very way they made their living was actually destroying the sport they loved and it was uh, desecrating the rock. So they asked themselves, and I think this was the critical first question, is there an alternative? And it turned out there was because British climbers, for most rock climbing, didn't use pitons at all. It had settled uh, long ago on using uh, these nuts. They were aluminum wedges that you could stick in a crack on a piece of wire or rope. And you could just kind of gently put that in the crack and twist it and it would hold under weight. So two problems. One, if you're an American climber, you're used to this reassuring feel of hammering hard steel into granite and trusting that that will hold your weight. And two, I mean, you're asking climbers to actually switch to the system that's a little more difficult to use and feels a lot um, more dicey. You're twisting this delicate piece of aluminum into a crack and expecting it to hold. And the second thing was it was a huge investment in tools and dies to make all the sizes of uh, chalks is what they were called that would be necessary to uh, provide a full range of gear for a climber's kit. So the solution they came upon, they, they de decided to make the investment 
But the critical thing that they did was to issue a catalog. They had issued catalogs before, but this was the first serious catalog. It had a 12-page article by Doug Robinson called The Whole Natural Art of Protection that was part user's manual and part manifesto. So it argued why people, why climbers should make the switch from pitons to chocks, except in the case of a new route, and then how to use them. So to give you an idea of the effect that this article had, is that the 70% of the business was pitons when the catalog went out, June of 1972. When I arrived to work in March of 1973, nine months later, 70% of the business was chocks. So that transition had, that article had been discussed at the base of every climb by every climbing club. It had been written up in every magazine and it changed the climbing habits of, of the community. So that was a big lesson. And it's not, you know, when we didn't use it very much over the next 15 years. Right, at, right after that catalog was issued was when we started to get into clothing. And we got into clothing largely because however much market share we had for climbing gear, however good our reputation was, we were making about a 1% profit. It was still a tiny company. And, you, you know, when you're, when you're making climbing equipment, there's no question about good, better or best quality. You're making best quality because people are trusting their lives to the gear. Yvonne was good friends with Doug Tompkins, whose wife had already, his first wife had started a clothing company. He had the contacts in Hong Kong. Evo had started to dabble in uh, putting some clothes in the catalog. He had imported a rugby shirt from Scotland. Rugby shirts were perfect for climbers because they're designed to be ripped off uh, your back during a game. So they had heavy rubber buttons and really good seams and very thick fabric. And those sold very well. So Patagonia grew out of that. Our first items were mostly heavy-duty sportswear. And then we started to develop this whole idea of layering for the outdoors of uh, creating a synthetic base layer, a kind of fuzzy high loft mid layer, and then a waterproof shell. And we really introduced that to outdoor stores, and that became the, the basis of our growth. So we had two big spurts, one in the 70s when we introduced this layering, and then in the 80s, we became kind of a fad on college campuses. We were growing like mad. We were adding new lines. We had a, a, a sailing line at one point for several years. We had an equestrian line. and then. In 1988, in the late 80s, we started to open retail stores, and we opened up this store in Boston in 1988 and um, used whatever we knew that was environmentally beneficial at that point in construction. We used low VOC paints, et cetera, recycled materials. Nevertheless, three days after we opened the store, the employees started to call in sick with headaches, stomach aches. So we shut the store down, called in an environmental engineer, he fixed the problem, and we asked him, well, that's great, but what, what was the cause of this? And he said, oh, it was uh, the, the formaldehyde off-gassing from the cotton clothes stored in your basement, right? Wow. So, <laughs> so, you know, we had been making, we had been in business for 30 years at that point. We knew the environmental implications of aluminum and of steel, of iron. Uh, we knew that half of our line came out of an oil well in terms of polyester and nylon. We had always thought of cotton as this kind of benign natural fiber. In fact, people were encouraging us to stop using nylon and start to go more to cotton because it was more natural. So when we, when we learned this, we commissioned a study of the four major fibers we use, wool, nylon, polyester, cotton. And we learned that cotton was by far the most environmentally harmful. And not so much because of formaldehyde, which is a finish used to stabilize the cotton, but because of the intense use of chemicals to grow the the plant. Um, at that time, it was something like 25% of all the pesticides used in agriculture, chemicals used in agriculture were used on cotton, which was 8% of arable land. Um, that figure has changed somewhat over time, but it really struck us. And, it, and, and it, I think what we went through, we went through kind of the same process we did when we discovered that pitons were damaging the rock. It was like, okay, is there an alternative? Is there anything we can do about this? And there was because organic cotton was still being grown uh, in China and Turkey. They hadn't changed yet. Uh, it was being grown by a cooperative in Texas that we still buy cotton from that had switched to organic because they lost uh, a family member to uh, 
cancer. Uh, he was very young and they suspected spraying. And it was grown in those days in California. So we started to look at this. And at that time, different companies, Gap, Levi's, Esprit, were coming out with limited eco labels of organic, organic cotton clothes, but they were very small parts of their business. And we looked this at is this. This is like the 90s or something? Or? Yeah, this is the early 90s. Early 90s. And we, we thought about this and we thought, you know, the problem is that there's no, there's no tangible difference in the product. When you hold an organic cotton shirt, you cannot tell the difference between that and a conventional cotton shirt. So if you're going to charge a lot more money for it and you're going to, art, you're, you're going to create shirts that are similar, the customer is going to be inclined to go for the one that's uh, cheaper. So what we decided to do is say, okay, we're going to switch all of our cotton sportswear to organic. And Elon was quite specific about it. He said, listen, I don't want to, I don't want to be in this business if it means selling cotton, uh, selling cotton clothes made with these chemicals, I would rather get out of sportswear, even though it's 25% of the business. So that was our mandate you know, over an 18 month period to take the whole sportswear line or, or organic. And we did a lot of homework. We bought most of the organic cotton being grown in California. We formed relationship with the farmers. We helped them get loans in some cases. And we thought we'd done all our, we learned how to pray for rain, you know, uh, uh, do a little dance because if uh, the rain hadn't come, we would have been out of the out of the sportswear business anyway that, that that fall. But what happened is we didn't do enough of our homework. And when we discontinued our relationship with the factories, when we bought the cotton from the farmers, they had no relationship with the spinners who turn the fiber into yarn. They had no relationship to the knitters and the weavers that turn um, yarn into fabric. And we started to get some, some feedback from the spinners that say, oh, we hate organic cotton. This stuff comes up our machines. Right? And then we started to get some, a little bit of uh, pushback from our employees. Um, Patagonia is a generally gentle culture to work with, but uh, people don't like to get pushed around. And some of the designers and the production people started saying, listen, I have to do everything I did last season. I've got to design the line. I've got to color. I've got to spec it. I've got to show it to the major accounts, go to the trade shows, do everything I did last season. But now you're asking me to find an entire new infrastructure for cotton sportswear. And you're asking me to raise the price three to five bucks on everything I sell. And not a single customer has asked for this. So why are we the crazy ones? The people who had actually been working on this problem were really convinced that <clears throat> we were taking the right steps. Um, the more they looked into the actual effects of these chemicals, uh, they thought, oh, my God, we, we can't go back into that business. So what we did, we ended up renting buses and taking employees 40 at a time to the San Joaquin Valley and going to convention, going to the cotton fields and then going to an organic farm at the end of the day. And the first thing you notice when you got into the cotton fields, if you open the door to the bus, was the smell. The organophosphates that are used to the cultivation of cotton weeds were developed as uh, nerve gases for World War I, and they smell the way you would expect them to smell. And the San Joaquin Valley has no drainage. It doesn't go out to the sea. And so it, it, everything kind of peters out toward the uh, edge of the Tehachapi Mountains. And there are... We, we, we would drive around in the buses and see these guys sitting around ponds with in armchairs or, or lawn chairs with shotguns. Um, they'd be shooting their shotguns into the air to prevent the birds from landing on the ponds because they were so polluted with selenium that they would uh, and not only die, but they would be, uh, if they did survive, their, their reproductive systems were screwed up. And then you also noticed in, on a conventional farm that there was no organic, if you dug your hand in the soil, there was no organic matter. There were no earthworms, which take three years to come back after you stop spraying. There were no uh, weeds. There's no, really no vegetation. And in fact, in a conventional field, the cotton is basically held mechanically in place in dead dirt, which is then fed fertilizer and water. And if you withdraw those inputs, the soil, the dirt doesn't have any capacity to grow anything. It doesn't have enough life in it. So we would bring people to the valley. There's one sort of famous story, a woman who 
who's had just had a baby who is now a product tester for us and works full time. And um, they went around to the gin in the back of the conventional field. And and she said, oh, what do you do with uh, with the gin is where they separate the fiber and the oil from them. And she said, what do you do with the oil? You throw that out? I said, oh, no, we capture more value from the oil than we do from from the fiber. So, well, what do you do with it? Oh, well, that goes into food, Uh, potato chips, mayonnaise, soap. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. I mean. So after that, people would come home and they'd say, you know, this is a pain, but the company is doing the right thing and, and we're going to help make this work. And I think that that was really a critical, critical moment for us. We actually did. We had to cut the sportswear line by, by a third. It took us a couple of years to get our margins back. It took a lot of work selling the products to get this over with the customer. But in the long run, it was successful. And I think what it did to the internal culture is it almost Almost if you're a runner, you want to improve your time. If you're a climber, you want to climb a route of greater difficulty. And for people who work at Patagonia, this then became a challenge. How do we, what's the next environmental challenge? How do we, how do we get rid of what we call the necessary harm from a product when an alternative was available? So that was a, a second big lesson for us. And there was another lesson kind of in between the climbing gear and developing the cotton which was influential for us, I think, on another level. So when I started, I was the only non-climber, non-surfer. I used to get a bonus of 10% every week on my paycheck if I worked 40 hours. And there were only two of us who did that because all the climbers would leave, would roll out of town on Thursday at noon to go to Yosemite and then come back in Tuesday morning at about nine o'clock after driving all night. And so, um, you know, it was kind of difficult to get the, uh, all of the production out. So the, they instituted this bonus plan. And, it, and aside from that, because everyone was a climber and a surfer and I was not, I was the only one to answer the phones when the waves fire, were firing. So I was tapped on the shoulder and made sales manager, which is I, what I did the first 20 years um, of my working life there. But the fact that people were climbers and, and, and surfers really was a huge determinant in the culture. There's something when, you, when you're when you a mile from the road in the mountains, there's something that just changes human experience. Absolutely. You, are, you no longer have the kinds of social protections you have in town. You're at once more far more vulnerable to nature's forces, and at the same time, you feel more self-reliant. You're carrying everything on your back or everything you need to eat, what you need to accommodate you when you sleep and when you're in the wild when you have this experience of being a human being in the wild i think it's something very difficult to explain to anyone who hasn't experienced that they just you know what does that mean you know um but if you have had that experience uh you it becomes a point of of sharing with other people who have had similar experience and it also creates a desire to protect those places it isn't just mountains it's also the the ocean uh, you know, you get just a few feet from the sand and you're, as a surfer, you're dealing with the, the power of the wind and the waves and it just changes you as a human being. But I think for, for us as a culture and as a business, this was important because we had this almost religious relationship to, to the wilderness that we really loved and respected it and uh, we wanted to protect it. So very early on in uh, the mid-1980s, uh, the Chouinard started to give one percent of sales uh, to grassroots environmental organizations, but there's kind of a story behind that, and that story is one that has nothing to do with the wilderness, but has to do with Ventura, the little town that we operate out of. And Ventura is uh, it's more generic now, but basically it was a a wild in the 1930s and 40s. It was kind of a wild oil patch. And, and still is. It was a lemon packing uh, town. And um, in spite of the great surfing spots, it's not what you would think of as wilderness, or it's not really what you would think of as a natural place. And then the, what made a difference for us, what taught us um, something about our relationship to the place we lived, and, what na- and that nature means more than just wilderness, is the Army Corps of Engineers uh, came to Ventura in 1974 with a proposal. They said, you have a river 
Ventura River that goes from the mountains and comes out to the sea by our headquarters, and it has no useful value. And what we want to do is to declare that river dead, and uh, we're going to encase it in concrete, uh, like the LA River down south, and we'll pay for it. And uh, you don't have to do a thing. This is, you know, just thank us. And everybody, this is the early 70s, everybody loved the idea. Um, no problem. I think the only reason people from Patagonia went to the city council meeting for the public, uh, um, uh, the, the mandatory public meeting, uh, was we were worried about some surf, uh, the surf breaks near the, near the mouth of the river. And everything was going well for the Army. Uh, nobody objected to this plan, um, except that the very last speaker was a 25-year-old biology student who got up and showed 25 slides of all the life that depended on the river. Uh, frogs, uh, river, uh, uh, birds, um, and at the end, uh, two uh, steelhead smolt. This has been a major steelhead river uh, in the early part of the 20th century before it was dammed. He said, what you need to do is not to declare the river dead, but to restore it to life. And that really came home to us. And what we, we, uh, we gave that guy a desk and a uh, phone and a mailbox. And you can still see it on the outside of our headquarters. Patagonia. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't work at Patagonia. He's actually a coastal commissioner now. Okay. But uh, there's still a little sign outside the door that says Friends of Ventura River. And so when we started to give a dozen years later, to environmental organizations, that's the kind of organization we were looking for. We were looking for people who were on the ground, who cared passionately about a particular uh, a stretch of water or patch of land that had the respect of the community. Um, and still to this day, now we support more than a thousand environmental organizations every year. And many of them have uh, a budget that's no bigger than a community church or um, and uh, same goes with the employees. So that was critical because I think what happened is that we understood from that presentation and going forward that nature is everything, that the health of nature as a system underlies the success of every industrial or social system, that nature is not just Yosemite, Kilimanjaro, or, or, or Rincon. It is really uh, the, 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 in, the ecosystem as a whole that underlies and connects life. So that was, I'd say, our, our third major lesson. The, you know, the fourth thing on our list uh, to talk about was an ad we took out in the New York Times on Black Friday, 2011, uh, with the headline, Don't Buy This Jacket. And there was, a, there was kind of a story leading up to that. So it goes back, um, goes back to the 90s after we had made the change to organic cotton. It goes back to we had started to look not just at our environmental impact, but also at our social impact. We'd started, there was a huge scandal in the 1990s of Kathy Lee Gifford, who was a celebrity at that time, was making clothes under her for name. For Walmart, right? For, right? for Walmart, yeah. yeah. And it was discovered yeah. that there were child sh children sewing those clothes. It started a huge move on campus um, and a, a substantial boycott. And uh, President Clinton convened um, several leaders to sit down and talk about that. We were at the meeting and we helped start an organization called Fair Labor Association, which actually went into the factories and started to monitor the uh, uh, conditions to see whether people were being paid legally and whether uh, w whether they were the floor place was too hot or whether chemicals were used well, et cetera, et cetera. So it is the early 2000s unrolled where working on several fronts. We're starting to look at the environmental implications of almost everything we use. And we're also starting to look at the social implications of our work as well. All this is done in the supply chain where we don't own any factories. We don't control directly the behavior of the people who are the employers here. And we became convinced the more we looked at everything, as we said, you know, we, this uh, the William McDonough's idea of cradle to cradle for recycling uh, anything that's made into something of equal value at the end of its life is really where we need to go as a society. So we made the commitment to, within five years, to take back anything we have ever made 
for recycling, which we do. Um, but we learned something along the way during those five years, and that was that there was a reason when you talk about the four R's, there's a reason that reduce comes before repair, which comes before reuse, which comes before recycle. It really, there's no point in having to recycle things that never should have been made in the first place because they were of, of poor quality or poor, poor utility. Um, we had, we discovered that our repair times were so slow that our people in the retail stores would give customer a free replacement garment rather than take something in for repair because it would take four or five months to get back. So we ramped up our repair facilities and started encouraging customers. We don't charge them, um, but repair a garment, it's per- it has a lot of life in it. And then we, we started to look at ways in which we could uh, provide platforms for people to resell or to give away clothes that they no longer use. Because again, so much has gone into a piece of clothing, both in human labor and in cost of the planet, that it's a shame that it doesn't actually get used. And so all of that stuff sitting in people's closets because they hate red now or they got fat, all of that should be out there. The hardest part for us to talk about was the idea of reduce. How do you, how do you as a consumer products company, uh, making your living off of clothes, tell your customers, buy less? And how do you, how do you frame that? And that's why we came up with this don't buy this jacket ad. It's the, it was a very, it was an attention grabbing headline. But when you got in deeper and you looked at the copy, we took one of the most environmentally beneficial products we make. Uh, and we, we said, okay, this is great. You know, this jacket is 40%, uh, recycled content, which is as high as we can get without, uh, sacrificing performance. Uh, it lasts 10 or 15 years. Everything about it, this is one of the things we're proud, this is one of the products we're proud of environmentally. And then we pointed out just how much water went into the making of that single garment, which would meet the needs of the village for a single day. That it generated 23 times its weight in greenhouse gases. Um, that it generated two-thirds of its weight in waste. And we said, listen, we don't know how. Nobody knows how to make anything that doesn't cost the planet more than we can pay back. So be respectful. Don't buy what you don't need. Take care of what you have. That we need to change the, uh, our relationship to things um, because we had developed for the first time in history a culture that, and an economy that is based on the accelerated consumption of disposable products. And when you stop the economy as it's structured now, when you stop doing that, you put people out of work. But no economy in history has ever been based on 70%, 75% disposable goods the way our economy is. So that was the idea of don't buy this jacket. And uh, it got quite a response. Um, And of course, people accused us of being hypocrites because they said, okay, we're going to, you're, you're increasing your sales. It's true. We did increase our sales that year though. I don't, I don't think it was the ad, but it also got a lot of attention. The woman who runs our environmental department had gone to visit her parents in suburban Connecticut for uh, Thanksgiving, and a neighbor came down the road, knocked on the door, and had the ad in his hand. And she thought, oh, my God, you know, this is a, a conservative you know, neighborhood, et cetera, is going to going to rip me apart and he said i just want you to know that i've been thinking about this for the longest time and i'm so grateful that somebody has finally said this talking about consumption and then last fall it's the best 50 um, grand uh, ad spend you've ever had huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 but but it gets better last fall when uh, we i went to the uh, launch of uh, Danone north america as a b corp and emmanuel fabe was there And it's his intention to make all of the Danone subsidiaries B Corps to take the global company B. And it's 26 billion euros. So that would be uh, many, many times uh, the size of any company that's a B Corp now. And he says that he was initially inspired by Don't Buy This Jacket. But he said what it taught him is that you could appeal to customers' values as well as to their instincts. And if I look back and if I want to connect these stories back to this original catalog with the um, urging customers to switch from pitons to chalks, it's a history of 
talking to our customers as friends and grown-ups, and that when we go through a learning process, that we share that with our customers in that kind of grown-up way, and that we've been able to be persuasive. So I think that that's kind of the developing model for the company over those 40 years and why I can would link those stories together. So if you give us an insight into the decision-making behind the, to run that ad, like were there people banging on the table like, this is a stu- stupid idea, we should never run, don't buy this jacket. And then people like, <laughs> yeah. oh yeah. Yeah, what, what yeah. was, didn't like you think of the what, tagline, you and Rick or something like that? or. or? Rick, Rick thought of it, and it had actually been used many years earlier by Doug Tompkins um, in an ad that said, don't buy this dress. But he ran it in Utney Reader, which was a kind of friendly publication in the early 90s and, and low, low circulation. So, you no, know, this is a major step for the company. It took a, a vote of the board. Um, Rick and I wrote the copy together, and even w- between us, uh, um, my wife teaches a class on, uh, on writing. Because uh, she's also a writer for Patagonia and has um, uh, several iterations, the early iterations of the of the copy that Rick and I worked on. It was a it was a fierce process, um, and it's an interesting contrast that five years later, when we uh, did 100 we, for Black Friday, we did 100 uh, percent for the planet, um, and that story, which is kind of fun, is we had committed to um, shutting our stores on Black Friday, painting the windows black, and suggesting people go outside and also volunteer for um, environmental organization. Monday morning, a fairly new and not very high level employee from uh, e-com came in and said, you know, this is wrong. What we should do is keep the stores open. And instead of giving 1% for the planet, which we've been doing for 30 years, give 100% of everything we make that day. And that decision, uh, he, whenever he came to work, that went to his boss, which went to um, the marketing people, and it went to the CFO by 11 o'clock. And by 1 o'clock that afternoon, Monday before Black Friday, we made the decision to go ahead and do that. Very different climate within the company than five years earlier when we had been really worried about don't buy this jacket and how it might affect sales in the most important time of the year for us. Um, yeah. Did 100% for the planet, was there any fear that like, oh, no, we have to do this every year? We can't just do it one year. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, we're, we're got we're pretty good about that. Yeah. We're pretty good about inconsistency. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we we never repeated "Don't buy this jacket" either. People would talk about that as a campaign. I said no. We placed it one time in the New York Times and never ran it again. Just, I like it. Well, whatever it whatever happened, it worked well. Um, right. You know, one of the things we had discussed is um, the mission statement, the evolution of the mission statement, and as of like this month or last month, you have a new one. Can you? As of what? Last week? Last week, yeah. 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 What is that process like? Well, the mission statement we developed 27 years ago, uh, the original one. And we had never had a mission statement before. Um, I remember being uh, opposed to adopting any mission statement in 1991 because I thought that they were um, usually nonsense. Uh, You know, you start to use the words strive or endeavor and foster, and it's all weasel words uh, 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 to say, okay, this is uh, what we want to be seen as doing, and it's what we'll do on a rainy day when we don't have time to run our core business. But the original mission statement was build the best product, cause no unnecessary harm, use business to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis. So this is after we'd started giving to 1% for the planet, but well before we introduced recycled polyester or switched to organic cotton. Um, it, was, uh, it was aspirational rather than a real statement when we adopted it. And I think over time, we came to really inhabit that mission statement. It's something that every employee knows um, and almost consults. And I, I think to some extent, it had become something that is a very comfortable uh, uh, reassuring, uh, and yet still uh, uh, fairly challenging uh, uh, words to live up to. But email has, over the past few years, has been um, frustrated with the mission statement on a couple of counts. One is that when we talk about causing no unnecessary harm, which I think is very good because that's really what you're doing, you're really 
when we're dealing with most of the clothing, we're talking about reducing the harm we do rather than doing anything positive that's actually adding to the ecosystem. But when you start to talk about regenerative agriculture, which we're doing now, which we're doing in the Patagonia provisions business, you can actually create positive good. When you restore soil to help, um, you're giving back more than you're taking. And we wanted to have some kind of allowance for that in the mission statement. And then the other thing that's happened, which is the bigger thing, which is I, I think for many people, climate change and the environmental crisis, including the species loss, has looked at it like something that's just around the corner. That's something that's going to be happening to us at some point soon. And I think by now it's become clear that it's here. Um, the kinds of fires that we've had in California for the past year, um, the intensity of the hurricanes that wiped out Mexico Beach, um, that left Puerto Rico without power for six months, that devastated Houston neighborhoods, that created forest fires in Norway for the first time. There are enough places on the planet being hit by all of the different manifestations of the environmental crisis that I think it's clear to anybody. It's clear to anybody who has a garden, a home garden, your, whatever your zone was in the book that you, in 2005 is now a different zone. Uh, when you go to plant your peas. And so what we wanted to do was to acknowledge that um, because the environmental crisis is so poorly dealt with, um, politicians don't want to touch it because there's no political pressure to do so. Businesses don't want to touch it because they think it's expensive. Ordinary citizens often don't want to touch it because they think there's nothing they can do other than recycle. What, what's happened is that the situation has gotten deeper. As you know, the carbon but the recent IPCC report, our, our carbon emissions have increased for the first time in a few years, et cetera, et cetera. So we changed the mission statement last week, and it's now um, we're in business to save our home planet. Very simple statement. In some ways more ambiguous than the one we had before because we don't say anything about product. Uh, or we don't say anything about the steps we'll take. But we've just put that forward as a very primary statement. We're we're in business to save our home planet. And we use the term home as a kind of, uh, as, as somebody asked, you know, why, why that word in there? And we said, well, I don't, I don't want to move to Mars. <laughs> and I, I, the, the, we have to have a sense that we're going to save the place we live uh, rather than um, uh, trash it out and find some techn technological solution for the future. How did you sort of uh, roll it out to staff and like, you know, what, what was the process like to actually come to it, come to that decision? Oh, we had a lot of fights. I mean, we, you know, we had a, we, we, um, we had a lot of questioning about is this specific enough? People love the mission statement, the old one there. Um, that's kind of at the heart of the culture. Uh, why make the change? Why the word home? Um, uh, shouldn't it be longer? Et cetera, et cetera. So we went through that process and then settled. No, we're, 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 we're going to make the simple, bold statement. We, we had an uh, all-company meeting uh, in Ventura. I mean, this is not all-company. It's all-Ventura meeting where the headquarters is. And uh, Evo and Rose uh, sat on the stage and uh, laid out the reasons for making the change. And, and that was also uh, um, uh, fed by video to uh, um, our we have uh, warehouses in uh, Reno and Wilkes-Barre and, and um, operations in Europe and Japan and Korea and Australia. So. And not to mention all the retail stores. like And all the retail stores. Yeah. And so do you think that, is this sort of like for the next 25 years, do you think? Or have you? Yeah. 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 No, I, I think so. Now, it may not be, but I, I think that what we've done is essentially set ourselves a new challenge. Just as we didn't inhabit the first mission statement, Totally, when we adopted it, um, this mission statement is going to take some time to figure out how we actually adapt the company and ourselves uh, to to those words, um, and but in a while before we can say, we can point to what we're doing. I think that that um, uh, makes those words feel real, and it, it, it's a bold enough statement. I, I hope. Uh, it, I, I mean. We don't have much more than 27 years to to uh, 
to turn the boat around. But uh, I, I, I think it will be uh, good for us for a good long time. You know, one of the things I was thinking of when you were explaining some of the evolution of Patagonia is the sort of garment industry itself. And like when, mm-hmm. you, when you first came to Patagonia, was it most clothes were made locally or were they still made? Had the sort of clothes making industry already left sort of the U.S. or yeah. California at least? Well, yeah, no, California had never been a big, big center. Um, it, uh, clothing manufacturing tended to follow fabrics. So for sportswear, the business at that time was uh, in the 70s was really centered in Hong Kong, not yet in China, which wasn't doing any uh, manufacturing for other countries yet. Um, Most of the technical clothes, the technical fabrics came uh, for the insulation, the fleece and the underwear came from South Carolina. So we tended to manufacture in those states. It was only with the 1990s and NAFTA uh, and GAP that you really had the the death of the textile industry for all intents and purposes in the United States. And and after that, pretty much all of uh, our production went overseas, except for very simple items like T-shirts and things like that that don't require a lot of expertise. 97% of all the clothing sold in the U.S. is imported. Wow. I mean, that always sort of stood out to me as like, I guess that's part of what I guess it's possible maybe with wool or something is you can actually mm. grow it more in say California and manufacture it. If there were mills, I guess that's why there's some folks like fiber shed who are doing the yeah. sort of, how do you yeah. reinvent the American garment industry or. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No fiber shed is doing wonderful stuff in it, but it's the scale is very small. Yeah. I have this, I have the feeling that, you know, the, the um, kind of a brief history, the, the, the cotton, was one of the big industrializing forces of the world. It was also, um, there's a wonderful uh, book by Sven Bickert on, on, the, um, on the cotton trade and how it was directly connected to the development of slavery. Um, because when you introduced the mechanical production of cotton, all of a sudden you had this immense capacity to make clothing, but you didn't have the workers and you didn't have the place to grow it. And so the South, became the place where you, you imported slaves and then you had the raw land which you could grow this cotton that would feed the mills in Manchester. It was the first, when you, when, if you were an area of the world and you're just industrializing the cotton mill and then the woolen mill, those were the, those were the, especially the cotton mill, that was the first thing you had. And then what would happen is that it was always a very low margin industry. And so as you industrialize, you wanted to attract industries that were more lucrative and then you would pay people more and then the garment industry would move on. So it moved on from England, it moved on from New England to the South, and then it moved to coastal China, then it moved to inland China, then it moved to Bangladesh. There's a whole kind of labor chase that's gone on for 200 years that I think is coming to a close because there's no, no place to go. I suspect that when clothing production comes back to the U.S., it will be because clothing production has finally become more automated. It's one of the uh, textile are highly uh, highly automated, but you still have human beings sewing the garments to fit to the human form. And they have, I think once that happens, when you when you automate eventually automate the industry, then the, the work will come back, but not the jobs. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Around you know, one of the other pieces that we were planning to touch on is this idea of planetary boundaries and. Um, Mm-hmm. You know, it's sort of like for as much as Patagonia tries to reduce its footprint, it's like you still can't get that to zero. I mean, I guess with regenerative agriculture, there's mm-hmm. like potential, but you know, for now, I guess most of it's clothing. Um, yeah. And so, how do you respond? I guess is like the question we were wanting to talk yeah. about is, is like, how do you respond yeah. if we believe in planetary ground boundaries? Right. Well, you know, first of all, just briefly, the, the planetary boundaries were described by the Stockholm Resilience Center for nine types of human activities that the planet can only, the planet has limited carrying capacity for absorption of chemicals for the amount of co2 etc cetera, etc cetera. so we, we looked at these and we say okay we we need to have our company live within those boundaries and then what do we need to do where are our impacts and in fact most of our impacts are in fabric a very small percentage of our environmental impact has anything to do with the stores we operate or our warehouses or our headquarters. 
it's almost all in the supply chain and within the supply chain it's like 80 percent traffic so then the question becomes how do you reduce the environmental impact of the mills which you um, don't what know. do you do <laughs> which we don't know yeah but we have relationships with them and so then the question we're, we're, we're starting to work with suppliers to, on their energy sources because that's a huge deal i mean we're if we're dealing with a factory that is wonderful in every other way, but still is fueled by coal, well, that's something that we can do something about. So we're looking at that. We're committed to becoming carbon neutral um, within about a decade, which will mean at first a lot of offsets and recs and things like that, but renewable energy credits. Um, but eventually, it, the, the larger meaning will come when we get away from the use of fossil fuels as a feedstock for polyester and nylon. And if we can either use 100% recycled uh, plastic for polyester and nylon without sacrificing performance or switch to a biological source for those materials without sacrificing land use, without taking that away from food, those are the next big steps for us. What are your thoughts on hemp? Because I think you have some hemp still. Oh, hemp. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Hemp is great. It's just a little it's, more rough um, on the skin, I guess, right? right? Yeah, yeah. People don't love it, but it's a wonderful fab, a wonderful fiber, and it's uh, easy to grow, and it's not nearly as uh, hard on the earth as uh, growing, growing even organic cotton. So that's one of the things also that we're looking at. With organic cotton, isn't the end of the story. You, know, you can do companion planting with cotton and turmeric. You can do. Uh, you want to make sure that you're not creating a monocultures of cotton fields. You want to reduce water usage as much as possible. So um, we have a long way to go there, too. You know, I'd love to hear you talk about sort of the difficulties of supply chain, just like getting your head around all the aspects of what's happening sort of in before things get to Patagonia. Because, I, you know, I lived yeah. in China. I was an English teacher for six months. And, you know, like I've seen some of those factories and like, yeah, yeah, they they can look great if you if they know the inspector's coming to like visit for a day, <laughs> give you a check and then like, you know, so how do you really, how do you really know even like what your suppliers are saying they're doing is actually happening really? Yeah. Well, there are kind of, there are all kinds of questions in there, but um, the kind of the answer to the last question, we, we've been auditing uh, conditions in the, in the factories in the, in the assembly factories for 20 years we also now have a, um, a social and environmental responsibility team of, uh, I think, maybe 20 people that we work directly. We go directly to the factories. That team actually has uh, veto power over our sourcing department. So people in our sourcing department go to they find a new factory and they say, oh, we love this place. It's got um, quality is excellent. We, we're, we're really sure about delivery. And uh, we've worked out a price we can live with. Our team goes in to inspect that factory before we can start making orders. And if they think that the, the factory is not ready, um, we don't go there. And I don't know of anybody else who does that. Probably we're not. also starting. Yeah, we're also starting to look seriously at the mills because people, all the brands are have their labor practices audited. It doesn't stop something like the Rana Plaza disaster in Bangladesh in, um, in 2011. Um, but nobody has looked at the mills. And so that's where we're starting to look into labor practices there. We have been for the last seven, seven years or so. Another sort of turn of the kaleidoscope on this very complicated issue, when we, we used to deal with, with about 150 different assembly factories and we were a much, much smaller company. And then about uh, 10 years ago, we cut that down to 45. Is what we wanted to do was to develop really close relationships with our suppliers so we could go in and talk to them about, oh, how are the chemicals being treated here? What are, how about introducing a, a fair trade uh, certified labor pro, uh, uh, program on the, on the factory floor? Uh, how about using uh, blue sign certified materials, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and we can do that when we're when we're working very closely with the factory as a partner and when we were spread out, it was like, you know, who, who, we didn't even know who they were. So, so that's another factor in, work, in working with the supply chain. Yeah. Yeah. It's just fascinating just because of the, 
and you know, I imagine part of this with this, this dovetail with the footprint chronicles, kind of your your work around looking at the you know actually publicizing the map of where the suppliers are at all. Yeah, like, is that, yeah. That dovetailing? You know, that was interesting. That was there were some un- unintended good consequences that came from the footprint chronicles, but we actually developed the footprint chronicles as an alternative to doing a, a corporate social responsibility report. Wow. There's a lot of big corporations, publicly traded corporations, started to produce those. There was a, a strong movement led by some very good people in um, the United States and Europe for companies to uh, report their environmental impact. And we, I wrote a report in 2003 using the GRI, which was the best standard at the time. We wrote the report, we looked it over, and we said, nah. Enough. Too much fluff or something. <laughs> well, it wasn't fluffy. It was too dry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was and 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 to meet that that requirement, it wasn't it wasn't a not, wasn't much of a story. So we shifted gears and came up with the idea of the Footprint Chronicles, in which we would talk about five different products from the oil well or the field, all the way to our warehouse shelves, and talk about what we liked about the product. What we didn't like, um, and then uh, yeah, what we like, what we don't like, and what we think was kind of a, a summation of where we thought we should go next. And we extended that to more of our products, and we gave, we provided pretty strong metrics on uh, water, energy used, uh, greenhouse gases, and waste generated, et cetera, et cetera. And we published our factory list. I don't think we were the first person, the first company to do that, but we did. But the interesting thing. Um, about that was the effect on the culture, on the internal culture. And um, I should have known because when I started working on the Footprint Chronicles a uh, good 10 years ago now, so I'd already been at the company for 35 years, and I was learning all of the stuff about how everything is made that I didn't know before. I'd always been on the sales and the marketing side and the storytelling side. So what happened is that same revelation occurred for employees who read the material that we were preparing. And all of a sudden, it made our internal conversations a lot smarter uh, because people understood what the tensions were between environmental advantages or performance needs. Um, They understood why we had made certain choices. Um, And that extended not only to the employees, but it started to extend to the suppliers as well. And, you know, the first time we approached the supplier and said, you know, we want to talk about this problem that we had. And um, and we solved it, and people, you know, go, oh, we don't want to, we don't want to talk about problems. But then when we did that, it was resolved. They started to get calls um, from people who wanted to deal with them, and from new supp- other suppliers would call up and say, we want to be featured in, in Footprint Chronicles. So and so, you never uh, Levi Strauss or no one came and swooped in and took a supplier from you because you had published their name or anything like that. Oh. <laughs> Well, you know, I that's I think that's right. the fear that, comp- that, that companies have is like publishing yeah. their will their competitors right. will steal their business. Right. But that's one of the things about having, you know, <clears throat> if you look at a factory that's making Patagonia stuff, they're also making things for other well known outdoor brands. Yeah. They're not um, they have a they have a multiple list and they have certain capacity, so they're going to attract the high end outdoor brands and they're not going to attract some others. So I think that that's kind of a myth of holding on to uh, holding on to that information. Um, in general, transparency I think is a, a much healthier strategy um, than holding things close to your vest because it spreads the information around. And particularly in a time where we do have a massive, uh, Pope Francis is called it was, uh, the social and the environmental crises are two two faces of one crisis. Yeah, um, and you have something that this is going to be the rest of not just my working lifetime, but your working lifetime, and those are the young people coming into Patagonia and the people I'm talking to in schools. When you're taking that kind of approach and saying, okay, it's now the responsibility of business not just to clean up after itself, which it has never done, but also to help solve some of the major social and environmental problems, then you need transparency because you need shared information. You want we, you know, when we introduced Ulex, this uh, uh, desert plant, uh, as a substitute for rubber for making wetsuits, we made that available to the surf industry because why would you 
hold on to that information. On a moral level, you want the environmental benefit to be spread as quickly as possible. From a, a strictly financial point of view, you want to commercialize the use of that fabric. So make it available. Yeah, I think that's... And has have folks adopted UX? Uh, I, I remember... Um, oh, that's, uh, Rose, that's a good question. Rose was telling uh, a story about like... Uh, <laughs> We, we gave away the technology for like the waterless jeans and no one took it. She's like, well, <laughs> yes, what's <I> your problem? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, not a lot of people have adopted organic cotton either. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, some things have um, spread more, more rapidly than others. Certainly when we helped uh, develop with Malden uh, recycled content for polyester fleece and that was well accepted. Some other things. Yeah. yeah one thing, one thing I've been curious about, it's a, it's more of a being transparent in the supply chain, but also, you know, sort of a, a crisis almost was the the whole Ovis Twenty One like uh, piece. Oh yeah, in like Argentina, yeah. the, the in like I guess for folks who don't know that, I think it was like there's like a network of wool suppliers in Argentina who do like really yeah. great holistic management and like carbon right. sequestering, but there was a a PETA, People for Ethical Treatment of Animals, like investigation. And I think one or a couple of the mills had, you know, they, it was like, you know, it was not good treatment of the animals, uh, I think. Right. And they were sort of calling exactly. out Patagonia as like, don't you see this or something like that? And I'm just kind of curious how that unfolded on from your end or, or the company's end. Yeah. 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 It was sad because we, um, it was a group of, of uh, farms that subscribe to these uh, practices that Alan Savory developed for regenerative grazing, as you mentioned. So it really helps you actually grow grass um, uh, by moving the sheep around. You, you restore the grass to help. And they, this is on, de- on, on farmland or pasture land that had been uh, degraded over 150 years' time. But yeah, PETA sent down, PETA is opposed to the use of animals for any purpose, for any human purpose, including pets. Um, uh, and they sent down a, um, uh, someone with a camera and took pictures of the animals being treated roughly. And uh, PETA's audience, PETA tends to use, um, has a very large mass audience. It has a lot of people who are very passionate about, um, about the treatment of animals. It uses... Um, uh, celebrity and also kind of uh, yellow journalism techniques to get its stories out. Um, so we got a yeah we got a lot of hate mail as a, as a result of that and uh, people threatening our stores and people people threatening Rose and um, oh, we wow, looked I didn't know people threatened Rose too wow yeah yeah um, it was pretty mean um, and we looked at this and we. We were using about 150 small farms to produce the wool for this program. It's a fairly small underwear program. And we thought, we, can we create a traceability program, which we've done for Down? Um, and we, we didn't think we could do it quickly enough. So we basically backed out of the wool business um, for the time being. And it's been very difficult to get back in. Um, the idea now is part of the regenerative organic standard is to um, mix, combine these, these wonderful uh, grazing standards with a really 21st century humane standards for the treatment of animals. Yeah, I was just, um, I'm noticing we're almost out of time here. And I uh, just wanted to, okay. I'm noting regenerative organic standard because I think that's something I'd love to dig into maybe on the next uh, episode. Okay. Yeah, you know, a lot of what I've heard from, folks who are more in the regenerative ag community is just that as a wool is particularly sustainable or regenerative, you know? Yeah. 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 Because of those, because of the grazing potential and um, no, it's a great fiber, but it's hard to, um, I think most, most farms have very small number of sheep. So it's kind of a, it's a, it's hard to put together. You know, and that's what I was 21 had done was to create a, um, sort of a cooperative of these 150 farms. Well, thanks, Vincent. Yeah, thanks for doing this. Next Economy Now is a production of Lyft Economy. Lyft is an impact consulting firm whose mission is to create, model, and share a locally self-reliant economy that works for the benefit of all life. 
To listen to all our past episodes or to share your thoughts about the show with us, visit www.lifteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash podcast. You can also subscribe to this podcast through iTunes, Overcast, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Please take a moment to rate us on iTunes. It's really very helpful in allowing these ideas to reach a wider audience. Once again, thanks for listening.